Let's talk about just for a few moments about what is Motor Cities. Uh, Motor Cities is a national heritage area. Uh, we are a private nonprofit organization, um, an affiliate of the National Park Service. And they, there are more than 55 national heritage areas around the country. We've just added six in the last year. Um, but we should probably tell you what exactly a national heritage area is. If we could have the next slide. A, na a national heritage area is a place designated by the US Congress to tell a unique American story. And we were designated by an act of Congress in 1998. You can see there the, the late Congressman John Dingell, who was the champion of the Motor Cities National Heritage Area and instrumental in its uh, passing Congress and being formed in 1998. This is the actual signing of the Automobile National Heritage Act signed by President Bill Clinton in 1998. And you can see a lot of the founders and, and important folks who were instrumental in uh, making Motor Cities a reality in that picture. A few of those people might even be on this call. And what is the mission of Motor Cities? We are dedicated to preserving, interpreting, and promoting our region's rich automotive and labor history and uh, leading to economic development. And we're, of course, also interested in enabling, supporting, and respecting our region's diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, you can see there our, our key founding partners, uh, of course, the big three, uh, along with the United Auto Workers International Union, and of course, the National Park Service. The Motor Cities National Heritage Area is, is quite large. Um, we have over 10,000 square miles. Uh, so it's not just Metro Detroit, it includes wonderful automotive historical cities and sites that include Flint, Lansing, and go all the way west out to our far western outpost, the Gilmore Car Museum, which is located north of Kalamazoo. I'm just gonna mention a few programs today, uh, one of which is our passport program. We have 26 attraction partners across our national heritage area, and we do offer a passport guide that echoes the idea of the National Parks Passport Program. So if you're familiar with those familiar blue passport books that you can get at national parks around the country, uh, we have one of our own. And like I said, there's 26 different uh, attractions in the new 2020 book, which is not pictured there, but um, will be available as soon as uh, we emerge out of this pandemic. Um, we also will have it dig digitally on the MotorCities.org website uh, very soon as well. The idea being that you can visit any one of those attractions and get your passport stamped. Also, we have 250 wayside signs around uh, the region. And uh, these basically tell a lot of the unique automotive and labor history stories that you can find in those different communities. Another very visible program from Motor Cities. And most recently, uh, we have new highway signs in the ground welcoming you to the Motor Cities National Heritage Area. There are currently nine of these signs in the ground, three in the Lansing area, one north of Flint, and five in the Metro Detroit area. Uh, my understanding from uh, Brian Yap is that we have permits now for an additional five, I believe, signs, and those will be being installed. Now that the construction uh, industry is back up and running, we should see an additional uh, five or six signs added over the next month or two. So we will have a total of 15 of these signs in the ground, bringing great visibility to Motor Cities and our work. And of course, part of what you're witnessing today in the Motor Cities at Home virtual program is 
a smattering of the offerings available through our Speakers Bureau. We currently have 21 different presentations, seven different presenters. I believe that actually has gone up to 22 presentations from eight different presenters. Um, so I have to update this slide. <laughs> um, these, once we, again, once we emerge from the pandemic, we hope to get back to the usual way of providing this service. And that is uh, taking uh, the opportunity to bring our speakers to groups around the area, uh, libraries and, and lots of different uh, folks that offer events. Um, so we're looking forward to getting back to that. But in the meantime, we are pleased to offer virtual programs featuring members of our Speakers Bureau. You can find us all over the World Wide Web. We have our wonderful website at MotorCities.org. I would encourage you, I only cover just a, a, a small microcosm of the programs and uh, things available through Motor Cities. So I would, if you're new to us, feel free to explore the website at MotorCities.org. And right there on the homepage, you can also sign up for our weekly e-newsletter, which is called You Ought to Know. That's A-U-T-O. We also uh, have a growing presence on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And uh, our YouTube channel, if you happen to miss last week's presentation with Steve Purdy, uh, that presentation is available on our YouTube page. And not too long after this program is completed, you'll be able to find Rust Ray's program there in case you want to see it again or share it with friends, family, and otherwise. So without any further ado, let me introduce today's speaker and we'll get started learning about Billy Durant, the founder of General Motors. Rust Ray, he's a member of our Motor Cities National Heritage Area Board of Directors. He is a resident of Northville and a member of the Henry Ford Heritage Association, as well as the Northville Historical Society. He holds a bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in the social sciences. He has a, a wonderful array of offerings available both through his Dore Productions, as well as through our Motor Cities Speakers Bureau. So without any further ado, I will say one more time to ask your questions using the chat section and we will get started. Here is Russ Dore. Hello, thanks for joining us today. Uh, Billy Durant uh, was an entrepreneur, not a builder of cars, but a builder of companies. He was a dreamer who put several companies together to form what became the world's largest corporation. It's hard to believe that this man who at one time was worth millions died penniless. It's also surprising for many people to learn that he almost uh, purchased a Ford Motor Company on two different occasions. So let's explore the life of this somewhat unknown icon of the automotive industry. William Crapo Durant was born December 8, 1861 in Boston. He had an older sister, Rosie. His father, William Clark Durant, was an unsuccessful land and stock speculator and also an alcoholic. His mother, Rebecca Crapo, was the daughter of Henry Howland Crapo, a very successful lumber baron in Flint, Michigan, who was elected mayor of Flint, Republican state senator, and then governor of Michigan. When Willie, as he was first known, was seven, his father left the family, and his mother moved from Boston to Flint to be near her parents. Willie was close to his mother all his life. Billy, not as he was now known, dropped out of school at age 16, six months short of graduation. He got a job at the Crapo Foundry started by his grandfather. He took a second job selling cigars door to door, sold more than three other agents combined. So the manager gave their territories to him. Billy had a love of playing checkers with his customers. Billy was a consummate salesman. Years later, Walter Chrysler said of him, I cannot hope to find words to express the charm of the man. 
He has the most winning personality of anyone I've ever known. He could coax a bird right down out of a tree, I think. Well, at age 20, Billy was asked to turn around the local waterworks, which he did in eight months. He also established a local insurance agency uh, where he made enough money to buy a home. So in 1885, he married Clara Pitt. She was the daughter of the Flint and Pier Marquette Railroad's local ticketmaster. They had a daughter, Marjorie, in 1887, and a son, Cliff, in 1890. Well, Billy bought a horse cart company for $2,000 he borrowed, and his friend Dallas Dort bought a half interest from him for $1,000. So Billy had $1,000 invested uh, on his own. It was called the Flint Horse Cart Company, and all they got was two completed carts and a patent. Well, Billy immediately took one cart to a show in Wisconsin and one a blue ribbon. He got 100 orders there, stopped in Milwaukee, got 35 more, went on to Chicago, picked up 465 more orders, so he came home with a total of 600 orders. But he and his partner had not built a single cart, nor did they have a factory in which to build them. Well, they arranged for production with a local company and sold 4,000 the first year. But the owner convinced a major dealer in Chicago to buy directly from him. So they bought a building, changed the name to Durant Dort Carriage Company, and built them themselves. One key was that they made their own components, which kept the cost down uh, compared to the competitors. Well, they built a variety of carriages, from small racing carts to larger passenger coaches. They set up a national network of franchise dealers. And by 1900, Durant Dort was the largest vehicle manufacturing manufacturer in the US. Vehicles, again, being horse-drawn uh, carriages. They built a headquarters building in Flint, which is now a small museum. Across the street is the original plant, now renovated by General Motors. It holds the Kettering University Automotive Archives. It's called Factory One. Billy Durant, not yet 40, was a millionaire whom they called King of the Carriage Makers. There's a statue in uh, Flint of uh, Billy Durant, and uh, uh, I have my, uh, my statue of Billy here. Uh, this was given to me by some people at GM a number of years ago after uh, we made a presentation, uh, uh, a live presentation, uh, where we had actors portray Billy Durant, Henry Ford, and uh, Walter Chrysler. Well, now to continue, we need to uh, shift to the automobile industry and leave Billy for a while because we need to talk about the origins of the companies that he eventually bought. The first company was Buick. Now, I know many of you uh, have owned Buicks and are interested in the, uh, in the origin of, of Buick. David Buick was born in 1854 in Scotland. At age 15, he went to work for Alexander Manufacturing Company in Detroit. They produced toilet bowls, and water closets. He and William Sherwood bought the company after it folded in 1882. They renamed it Buick and Sherwood Company. He sold his interest to Sherwood and started Buick Manufacturing Company with investors and a small amount of equity in 1902 to develop his own automobile. This is the first Buick test driven by Walter Marr and Tom Buick in July of 1904. We need the next slide here. Uh, Walter Meyer and Tom Buick test driving the uh, first Buick in 1904. Well, he couldn't maintain the equity that he agreed to uh, in his and in investors uh, now owned the company. They had only built 37 cars in 1904. So now we'll leave uh, Buick and uh, pick it up again when Billy Durant gets involved. Well, the next car that we need to talk about, a uh, company they purchased was Olds. And again, I'm sure uh, uh, many of you had an Olds. Uh, so let's look at the Oldsmobile company origins. Ransom E. Olds was born in 1864 in Ohio. He moved to Lansing, Michigan, where his father set up a machine shop. Ranny, as he was called, 
built his first horseless carriage in 1887 at age 23. His father retired and Randy built a factory in Lansing, the first plant in America built exclusively for the manufacture of automobiles. He got some investors and built a larger plant in Detroit. They called it the Olds Motor Works. They built 11 models, but none sold very well. Well, then he developed a small, dependable and affordable car, the Curved Dash Oldsmobile the first volume produced car in America. Well, the Detroit plant burned uh, and rather than rebuild in Detroit, they built a new plant in Lansing. They sold 4,000 curved dash Oldsmobiles for $650 each in 1903. Now that's the same year that Henry Ford started his currently existing Ford Motor Company. Olds used a version of an assembly line where parts were laid out on the floor and workers moved down the line. Well, Ransom E. Olds had a falling out with his financial backer, Fred Smith, and the uh, Oldsmobile management team. So he left Oldsmobile and formed a Rio using his initials, R-E-O. Fred Smith then ran Oldsmobile. Unfortunately, by 1908, Rio was selling, outselling Oldsmobile and Oldsmobile was in trouble. Again, coming back uh, later to pick up uh, where, uh, <laughs> where uh, uh, Billy Durant gets involved. And the next car that uh, we need to talk about is Cadillac. So let's look at the origins of Cadillac. Henry Leland was born in 1843 in Vermont. He was an apprentice machinist at age 16 in Massachusetts. He was a machinist for Brown and Sharp, the leading tool maker in the US was given sales responsibility for everything west of Pittsburgh. Then he opened his own machine shop in Detroit in 1890. His son Wilford trained machinists, including a fellow named Horace Dodge. Well, they built engines for the Curve Dash Oldsmobile. Henry built a new engine, a 10.25 horsepower engine, and said that would be better than the three horsepower engine they were using. Well, Ohl said that they didn't want to redesign the chassis for the new engine, and they didn't want to have to retool the factory, so they weren't going to uh, utilize that engine. Meanwhile, the Henry Ford Company had let Henry Ford go. This was Henry's second company before he founded the uh, Ford Motor Company. Uh, they felt he was too involved in racing and not enough in developing a passenger automobile. So they paid him $900 for his body design and sent him packing. Well, they were gonna close the factory, so they brought in Henry Leland to appraise the equipment and find out how much to sell it for. Henry Leland looked around and said, you know, this is a pretty good operation. I think we can make it go. So the investor said, let's give it a try. So they put Leland in charge. Well, he had one problem because it was called the Henry Ford Company. And of course they had no Henry Ford. So uh, Leland had to come up with a new name and he named it uh, Cadillac after the French explorer who uh, established Detroit. And in uh, fact, the hood ornament on the Cadillac is the family crest of the Cadillac company. Well, in 1908, Cadillac won the prestigious Dewar Trophy for manufacturing excellence from the Royal Automobile Club of London, which gave them a lot of uh, prestige. Now we come back to Billy Durant, and uh, let's talk about he got, how he got into the automobile business. Yes. He, uh, he got into the automobile business uh, more by accident than by plan. Flinders adopted the name Vehicle City because it was a leading manufacturing city for carriages in the country. Well, when Buick was started, <coughs> excuse me, they envisioned it, envisioned it continuing with uh, the new vehicle, the automobile. But then the city leaders became very concerned when Buick faltered. So James Whiting of Flint Wagon Works, who was actually a competitor of Billy's, bought Buick to save it from financial ruin and help the city of Flint. But he needed somebody to manage it, so he talked to Billy. Billy wasn't very interested. So he loaned Durant a 1904 Buick 20, owned by a friend, and said, drive it for a couple months and see, and he thought he might get turned on to this new uh, vehicle. Well, for two months, Durant drove it over all kinds of roads and hazards. Uh, I'm not sure this is a Buick, but this kind of shows the uh, 
the roads of those days are not too different from some of the roads uh, that we have still today here in Michigan. Anyway, Billy was so impressed that he did take over the management of Buick in 1904. Well, he exhibited at Buick at the 1905 New York Automobile Show and manned the exhibit himself, returned home with 1,108 orders. The Durant Dort Company bought a third of the shares in Buick and the investors bought the rest to raise the $500,000 needed to start the company. They used the Durant Dort plant in Jackson, Michigan to fill orders, one plant that wasn't being used. <clears throat> While they built a new plant in Flint, Billy set up a national network of 13 Buick distributors in 1905. One was an interesting guy, Charles Howard. He was a bicycle dealer in San Francisco and he became a distributor for eight Western states. He became very wealthy and uh, later owned Kentucky Derby winner Seabiscuit. The same year that he borrowed $100,000, the same year he provided $100,000 to Charlie Mott to build an Assel plant next to the new Buick plant. So this is the beginning of vertical integration and just-in-time delivery. Well, Durant bought David Buick's last share of stock in the company for $100,000. Unfortunately, David Buick lost it all in a series of bad investments and died in 1929 in the charity ward of Har Harper Hospital in Detroit. At the start of 1908, Buick was number one in sales. It was overtaken later by Ford uh, once the Model T came out, and of course that did come out in 1980. <clears throat> so now let's talk about how GM got started. Well, the origin of GM started with a meeting Durant held in his room at the original Pontchartrain Hotel in Detroit, uh, which no longer uh, exists. It's been replaced. The meeting was with Henry Ford, Ransom Olds, who now owned Rio, and a fellow named Ben Briscoe of the Maxwell Briscoe Company. The idea was to merge their four companies into a single enterprise. Briscoe had previously been an investor in Buick. Well, the J.P. Morgan Company had suggested to Briscoe that they merge several automobile companies. They had done this to form U.S. Steel. Uh, there were 423 companies <clears throat> in the U.S., excuse me, <clears throat> organized specifically to manufacture automobiles. Briscoe suggested the top 20 companies. Well, he said, let's keep it a little more simple and let's start with only four. Well, the meeting was actually scheduled at the Penobscot building, but the four owners arrived with a cadre of associates and advisors. Durant felt this would create too much attention in the press and quietly asked the other three if they would meet him in a room that he kept at the Pontchartrain Hotel. Well, after several more meetings, it became apparent that Henry Ford would uh, join, provided he get $3 million in cash plus stock in the new company. Well, when Ransom Olds heard that Henry Ford wanted cash, Olds wanted cash too. Well, it wasn't possible for Durant to come up with enough cash. So that deal did not go through. So uh, at this point, it was possible that Ford Motor Company could have been a, a division of General Motors. But Durant had a plan B. Took a night train to Lansing, called on Fred Smith of Olds Motor Works at three in the morning, toured the plant. He knew that Olds was losing money. And uh, <clears throat> so Durant proposed a holding company, General Motors, which would include Buick and Olds. Smith agreed to a stock exchange and General Motors was incorporated on September 16th, 1908. They did not announce it to the press until December. Well, during this hectic entrepreneurial activity, Billy's personal life was changing. Two years earlier, he had been introduced by his daughter to a 19-year-old friend of hers, Catherine Laterer. Billy left his wife, Clara, and asked Catherine's mother if he could see Catherine socially. Well, since Billy was technically still married, uh, the mother said no. So he hired Catherine as secretary. Clara put herself in a rest home in North Carolina and filed for divorce. Well, the divorce was final two years later on May 27, 1908. The very next day he married Catherine Later. She was 20, he was 46. Clara moved to California with her 19-year-old son Clifford and never saw Billy again. 
Billy Stein Clifford became a race driver in California Playboy with no steady job and was described as having a more than ample girth. He died of a heart attack in 1937, 10 years before his father. Billy's daughter Marjorie married Billy's doctor, Edwin Campbell. He eventually left his medical practice and became a key executive in General Motors. Campbell and Marjorie were later divorced and she went through two more divorces. She and her fourth husband were arrested for drug dealing in 1947 and reportedly were drug addicts. So now let's talk about the next acquisition. Uh, I know several of you might have had Pontiacs. Um, I learned to drive on a Pontiac. Our family car was a 1937 Pontiac with a stick shift. And I mean the old uh, fashioned stick shift, the long one. Uh, now I'm I'm not that old. Uh, uh, our family car was pretty old by then. So uh, even though it was in 1937, uh, uh, I was uh, not learning to drive in 1937. Well, so Billy's next acquisition was the Oakland Motor Company, which was founded by Edward Murphy in 1907, headquartered in Pontiac, Michigan. The first car, the Model K, won a hill climbing championship in 1907. He only sold 278 automobiles in 1908. So Durant bought it for a song in January of 1909. They later added the Pontiac model, which outsold the Oakland, so they changed the brand name to Pontiac. Now that GM was founded, Billy looked at his new acquisitions. He thought Oldsmobile had a great brand recognition because partly because of the popular song in my Mary Oldsmobile. Durant found that Olds was run by men more concerned with near-term profits than high-quality cars. The new mid-sized six-cylinder was not competitive. It was too expensive for its size. So Durant went to the Olds plan, brought back a Buick 10. In those days, the chassis were made of wood. He had to take off the wooden body and put it on sawhorses. And he said, cut it in half lengthwise with a cross-cut saw and cut it in half crosswise with a crosscut saw and stretch each side out, make it six inches longer and six inches wider. He said, and there's your Oldsmobile for the coming year. He said later, I do not know of an automobile ever created in such a short space of time and such a low cost as the publicly accepted small Oldsmobile. That was pretty much Billy's only uh, foray into automotive design, but it was pretty significant. So the Buick Model 10 was selling for $1,000 and the new slightly larger Oldsmobile Model 20 was put on the market at $1,250 and they couldn't sell them fast enough. In 1909, the first year they sold 6,500 units and gave Olds its first profitable year since 1906. So the next car that uh, Billy was involved with was Cadillac. Well, uh, he bought that in 1909. Cadillac had a great product, was not being managed profitably, and was available at a bargain. He issued banknotes using Buick as collateral rather than issuing more GM stock or seeking loans. GM got its entire purchase price back in a little over than one year. In 1912, Cadillac introduced the electric self-starter, a big advantage over the hand-cranked competition. As you know, uh, women were not driving uh, uh, gasoline-powered cars. They were driving electric cars because uh, they were afraid to, that they might get whiplash and break their wrist uh, cranking a car where they didn't have the power to crank the car. And so when Cadillac came out with the self-starter, this opened up uh, uh, quite a market advantage. And uh, of course, all the other cars added it on later. Well, Durant tried to buy Ford in 1908, tried once again, but couldn't raise $2 million in upfront cash required by Ford this time as part of the, of the overall offer of $8 million. Uh, he had bought a lot of other cars. Uh, we only talk about the ones that survived, but he bought a lot of other companies. And I think the stockholder said, Billy, you got just too many car companies you bought here. Uh, you've got four of them that are working pretty well. Let's just pass on this one. Uh, this Ford thing probably won't amount to much anyway. How about uh, GMC? Any of you folks have uh, GMC trucks or want to know about the 
origin of uh, GMC. Well, this is a beauty, isn't it? He bought the Reliance Truck Company of Lansing and the Rapid Motor Company of Pontiac, which he later combined into GMC truck. Then he added the McLaughlin Motor Company in Ontario, Canada, which later became General Motors of Canada. You notice that the McLaughlin name is there on the grill, but if you look above it uh, on the radiator, you'll see Buick. Uh, so evidently they just uh, shipped the Buicks across the border, slapped the McLaughlin on them, and you had the McLaughlin Motor Car Company, uh, again, which later became part of General Motors of Canada. So now the company, by 1910, GM had 14,000 employees worth $54 million. Durand had paid only $33 million and less than $7 million in cash. Well, in 1910, big problems arose. The market for large cars dried up. People were flocking to Henry Ford's reliable and inexpensive Model T, his only model. GM offered 21 different models of larger cars produced by 10 independent divisions, few of which were profitable. So Billy Durant's image went from genius to foolish speculator. In order to borrow money to keep GM afloat, a syndicate of 22 banks was set up a new structure. Management would be in the hands of five directors and Billy now would only be one of the five with one vote and had to step down as president. Well, we've covered Billy Durant's life and career up through the point where he founded General Motors, uh, became president, and was ousted as president. Uh, this is part of a longer live presentation uh, that lasts an hour or an hour and a quarter. Uh, and uh, then we pick up uh, from this point on other things, such as the role of Walter Chrysler and Charlie Nash at GM, talk about how Billy returns as president of GM, how Chevrolet is added, how Delco and AC Sparkplug are added, and how Billy Duran is finally pushed out again completely. Uh, and how he founded General Motors. He had just gone bankrupt and he got enough investors and convinced him to form a new company. Uh, well, it, it lasted a while, but uh, finally uh, uh, folded up. And Duran's final business ventures, bowling alleys, and we talk about that. We talked then about Durant's financial collapse in his last years, and then being that Henry Ford is the icon of the automotive industry, I do a comparison of the similarities and differences on strengths and weaknesses of uh, Billy Durant and Henry Ford. So that's, uh, that's the longer presentation. Uh, now I do have, uh, as was mentioned, I have a lot of other presentations, one on Henry Ford, one on Walter Chrysler, one on the four that didn't quite make it into the big three, but were great companies, Studebaker, Packard, Nash, and Hudson. One on the Dodge Brothers, who were characters, as you know. Uh, then I branched off into auto, uh, uh, air, aircraft. I worked for Boeing for a few years. So I've got one on the origin of the commercial aviation, the Wright Brothers, Bill Boeing, and Donald Douglas. Then we have some interactive ones where we have actors portray these people. We have one called Henry and Friends with Ford Edison Firestone. The big three in 1925 with Ford, Durant, and Chrysler. Uh, my whole uh, career has been spent uh, studying leadership and doing management and leadership development in industry. So I branched out into some other leaders. And we have Harry and Bess Truman, Joe and Rose Kennedy, Mark Twain, his wit, his wisdom, and his wife. I'm also working on a brand new production uh, like this, a PowerPoint one, on electric cars, past, present, and future. And as soon as uh, things settle back down, I'll be, uh, I'll be giving that one. And also a new one on Orville and Catherine Wright, which is an interactive one. So uh, the next uh, slide shows uh, our Henry and Friends. Uh, we have Thomas Edison on the left, who bears a strange resemblance to me, Henry Ford, and Harvey Firestone. So if you'd like any of these presentations uh, for your local library, historic society, uh, senior center, or other organization, uh, please have them contact me and get uh, me through the Speakers Bureau or through my contact information. I do have a uh, website, the bottom, doraproductions.weebly.com, where I post a schedule of all my live performances. Most of them are free. You do have to uh, sign up most of the time, but uh, be glad to see you at one of those. So uh, thank you very much for your attention today. And uh, Bob, uh, do we have some questions? Yes, we do, Russ. Um, I have a couple questions that have come in. 
And certainly if you want to ask a question of Russ, uh, feel free to post that in the chat section. Uh, the first question we have came from uh, Frank Marcus, and it's about Cadillac and the Cadillac crest. Um, what is it patterned after? Is that Henry Leland's family crest or is that of Antoine de la Moth Cadillac? Cadillac. <laughs> you pronounce it very well. <laughs> Yes. Well, yes, the Cadillac family. 18 years at the Detroit Historical Society, yeah. got to know it fairly Good. well. Good. Yeah. The Cadillac company. Good to see you, okay. Frank. Okay. And then uh, we also had a question from um, Robert and asked about uh, Billy's wife, Catherine, and how she got the nickname Muddy. Oh, boy. Uh, don't know that. You know, I keep learning things. So if you know, uh, maybe you can tell us. <laughs> I always like to learn new things. That's an addition of Stump the Band. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Do we have uh, any other questions? Um, that's what I see in the chat section at the present time. Um, I guess um, we do have some time if we want to open up the mics a bit and uh, perhaps interact for a short time before I close things down. <laughs> Anybody have any additional questions or uh, let's try not to uh, step on each other. How did the bowling alleys work out for Durant? Uh, he was ahead of his time. <laughs> he, uh, he had one in Flint and uh, his idea was to have a network across the country, and, and later on, bowling alleys became a big deal, but, uh, but he was ahead of his time, and unfortunately, he had a stroke and wasn't able to carry out uh, that whole bowling alley uh, venture. Any other questions? So he died no. penniless, and um, that's pretty sad, actually. Really? He just kept going uh, downhill financially, and... Um, uh, mainly it was business that drove him, uh, his business ventures and they're losing their luster that drove him into financial ruin or was there other factors in his life? No, he just, he was always the eternal optimist. And we talk all about that, how during the depression, he tried to save the company and invested himself uh, and, uh, and then uh, uh, lost it in the market. When the price went down, he wasn't able to cover his uh, investments. Uh, so it was stock market, uh, uh, losses. Um, yeah, it's sad. In the last uh, three years of his life, uh, Alfred Sloan, who we also talk about, who's really the one that built GM into the, you know, uh, world's largest corporation. But as I like to say, uh, uh, without Billy, there would have been nothing for Sloan to build. So uh, although Sloan got credit for making it a uh, world's largest corporation, Billy, Billy's the one that started. Anyway, Alfred Sloan, C.S. No, I was, it's, I'm just asking questions now. And, uh, and Sam McLaughlin. Uh, can you hear me? I, I don't know she said she was going to come and pick up that. Hello? Oh. oh. And I haven't talked to her. Okay, can we uh, keep the uh, distracted so, talking to a minimum? Um, we got one question that came in from Arnold Collins about uh, Rapid and Reliance and the formation of uh, GMC. Were they related? Uh, not, not that I know of. They were just two, two uh, successful companies. And, uh, uh, hey, if I, again, that I, one, if I, you want me to take that one, Bob, Rapid and Reliance were separate companies. They also bought mm -hmm. Randolph mm -hmm. and built all three at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, GMC was simply the the, the uh, umbrella, they started putting little GMC badge on the on the on those Rapid and Reliance trucks. And then they just got rid of Rapid and Reliance and rolled them into GMC. Thanks, Kevin. You're welcome. That's uh, Kevin Kerbitz uh, on the line from uh, General Motors. Factory One. Up there, up there. Are you actually uh, at Factory One today or still working from home? Still working from home. We haven't reopened, so I'm down in my Buick bunker. <laughs> <laughs> a very impressive bunker it is. <laughs> okay. Are there this any is, other uh, Dick, questions? Dick Russell from uh, Haven Hill. 
What the? Go ahead. Dick Russell from Haven Hill. Uh, I'm also on the board of uh, the Highland Activity Center, and we had scheduled Rust Ray for this presentation uh, on the 25th of March, and then the pandemic helped, and we had to cancel, unfortunately. So this is my first chance to see uh, the Billy Durant presentation, but I've been involved. We've had Russ out before to do uh, the Trumans. Uh, I've also had, uh, under the Friends of Highland Recreation Area, his presentation on the Dodge Brothers was fantastic. So, Russ, we appreciate the opportunity to see you today and the information you shared. Good. I'm looking forward to uh, coming out and doing the, uh, the the full presentation on Duran. Great. I don't know when we can get the calendar to operate and situation to be right, but we appreciate your opportunity to come when you do. Okay. Well, any I, any other questions before we uh, wrap up here? I don't see any additional uh, questions on the chat. I am uh, looking forward to uh, telling you a little bit about next week's presentation in just a couple minutes. But if there's anything else before we do wrap up, uh, feel free to, uh, to speak up. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. All right. Thanks. All right. Well, just to, uh, to wrap up, thank you again for uh, participating today in our second Motor Cities at Home presentation. Again, I encourage you to explore our MotorCities.org website if you want to know more about Motor Cities and what we do, all the great programs like this that we provide to the community, MotorCities.org. You can also become a member of Motor Cities if you, if you like what you heard today and you'd like to support our work. Uh, we also posted a, pal, a PayPal link in the Zoom chat area in case you wanted to uh, make a donation in support of Motor Cities programming and efforts that we do throughout our 10,000 square miles. And um, also want to talk about next week uh, for those folks that love to see great uh, great old classic American cars. We have coming up next Friday, May 29th, one week from today at noon, cool cars, unique automobiles from the Detroit Historical Society collection. And the gentleman who is uh, doing that presentation is actually on this call right now. He is the director of collections for the Detroit Historical Society. And his name is Jeremy Dimmick. And, um, Jeremy, I'd encourage you if you could unmute yourself. It'd be great to hear just a little sneak preview of, of, of what we can expect to see next week. Yeah, sure thing. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, my name's uh, Jeremy. I'm the Director of Collections at Detroit Historical, and uh, we have 70 cars in our collection. Uh, they're all what we call uh, cars built in the Detroit style of manufacturing, which is really just a fancy way to say they're mass-produced uh, Detroit built cars. Um, so it's really emblematic in a lot of ways of uh, just kind of a snapshot of material that was on the road at any given time. So we have, uh, you know, a 1988 Ford Taurus, we have a, a 1984 Dodge Caravan. Um, but then also as part of uh, this collection, we have some pretty far out stuff too. You see the Chrysler Airflow, uh, Chrysler Turbine, and of course a 1935 Stout Scarab uh, pictured there on the lower left. Um, so we have a handful of concept and one-of-a-kind vehicles, too, that I'll talk about. Um, some weird format stuff, like the uh, Scripps Booth collection we have, the Buy Auto Go, and a handful of cycle cars also um, that are pretty interesting to dig into and see some of the details in. Um, so yeah, I'll walk you through kind of all the good, the bad, and the ugly of what we have uh, next week if you're able to join us. Thank you, Jeremy. I you're hope welcome. to see as many of you as possible next week, Friday, May 29th, for that next edition of Motor Cities at Home. In the meantime, everybody have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. And uh, again, uh, be sure to uh, check us out. If you missed any portion of today's presentation, it will be posted on YouTube later today. And um, we look forward to seeing you again next week. Have a great day. Happy Memorial Weekend, everybody. Thank you.